Um, welcome. I'm going to be giving a little presentation this morning about, am I allowed to say Android Widevine? Okay. So as the slide says, this is about Android Widevine on Opti. Uh, my name is David Brown. Becker and I work on the software the security working group at Lenaro. And we've been working on this project for, well, since the last Connect, basically, to, uh, well, to get into the presentation. So what I want to cover today is some motivations for this. Um, I'm going to try to give a little bit of background as to why this is needed and why it's a lot harder of a problem than it may seem at first, I including some things on how not to do it, some pretty pictures, what Opti is vaguely and how that is involved in what we're doing here, some general solutions, and then an overview of Widevine itself. So, imagine you sit down at your Linux machine and you'd like to play a video. So this diagram is kind of a typical view of what goes on when that happens. Um, you think of this horizontal barrier between user space and kernel space with the kernel down at the bottom and a, some kind of media player up at the top. We start out with protected content on some server on the internet that's encrypted with some key, theoretically, the user does not have access to. There's a, a license manager that negotiates with this license server to convince it that this content playback is authorized. The key should be downloaded. We store this secret key, and then as we stream the video, we decrypt that data, send it out to some kind of codec, which decompresses usually H.264, MPEG, something like that, sends it to a video driver, and the video goes out the screen and you get to watch it. So, we call this affectionately software playback. And there's kind of a problem here that I've color-coded the different things here. The key information is that beautiful beige color. Um, the encrypted data is that dark blue, but there's those red arrows, and this is plain text version of the video content that you're watching. And as you notice, this lives in user space. It's decrypted by a user space program. Eventually, it makes it out to the kernel, out to the display, but it's really easy for a malicious user, an ordinary user, to stash this content away, do something else. And the main consequence of this is, as I said here, the creators are sad. The content creators, studios, whoever makes this content doesn't want people doing this. And with this kind of playback, it's easy to do. And the kind of compromise that we've ended up with is you don't get HD. You get a tiny little grainy, fuzzy window of video when you have this kind of playback solution. So let's talk a little bit more about how not to do this. What, what's, what's wrong here? So the biggest problem is that the video is decrypted and the plain text passes through user space. Um, there's all kinds of things that can be exploited in this thing. If you become root, it's pretty trivial. You can detrace another process. You can get its memory. Um, you can find an exploit in the user space player. There's just all kinds of things that make it really easy to get to the content. And if you notice in this picture, the secret key itself is stored in user space. And this is actually also really bad. Um, with that key, this gives me the ability to just, I go ask the media server for the encrypted content and then do whatever I want to with it because I have the key. So can we do better than that is, is the real question. So this diagram looks very similar to the last one. Um, the main difference here is that we've pushed the decryption of the video content to a hardware decoder. So the, or sorry, the decompression of the video into a hardware decoder. So the video is still just a secret key in user space. It's decrypted, sent to this piece of hardware, which then decodes it, plays it back. Now the reason this is better is there's a lot less of the plain text video that's available to, to access. 
Um, it's not that much better, though. Um, we, we, I mean, less is still accessible, but the plain text is still in user space, and the creators are still sad. Um, we don't get our HD video. OK, let's push more of it down into the kernel, then. We put the key in the kernel, have it stored there, do the decryption in kernel space, move it into the hardware codec, play it out. So we're a lot better now. The video doesn't ever live in user space. Um, it's a lot harder to get to, but the key still passes through user space. If you see the, the beige arrows there, the, in order to store this secret key in user space, if you're in, in the kernel, it comes over the network, it's decoded, however, and then it's sent to the kernel directly. So, but a deeper problem with that is that the kernel itself has a lot of vulnerabilities that, you know, keep being discovered. And you, you find an exploit in the kernel, and we can still get the video. And our, as I said, the creators are still sad. So how do we do this better? So what we do is we have this thing called a key box, which is a, a secret. It's a, a secret that's only known between this system and the, the license server. And we use that to encrypt the secret key before it is sent over the network, sent to user space. So this gives us the advantage that we keep the key out of user space. The, um, we'll get in a minute just to how you deal with this key box. Um, we still have all the same problems with the kernel, though, that, you know, yes, all the plain text, the keys, everything secret is kept out of user space. We're doing pretty good here. Kernel exploits are still possible, and that means that the creators are still sad we don't get HD. So, at this point, on a typical Linux system, this is kind of the best we can do. We don't have anything better than the kernel to protect things, so we need to look further into something, in this particular case, Opti, and specifically there's something called Arm Trust Zone, which is not just one thing, it's a description of several things of this story of how you have a secure operating system that runs alongside the kernel, and this is secure through boot into this operating system running that can then be called into from the kernel, but the kernel doesn't have access to this secure operating system. Um, there's a global platform T specification, so this is a standards body with a specification of how you have an API to a trusted execution environment. And specifically, Opti is Linaro's implementation of this specification. It allows you to write trusted applications. They're kind of like applications in a regular Linux machine, except they run in this trusted special environment that's inaccessible to kernel, user space, anything running outside of the trusted environment. So vaguely, it looks something like this. This is kind of simplified to give an idea of what's going on. So whereas before we had the kernel at the bottom with a little dotted line, and then user space lives above the kernel for, and there's a protection boundary between that. We have another protection boundary between the RE, the rich execution environment, and the T, the trusted execution environment. And things that happen inside of this trusted environment are protected. The only way to access them is through a specific API that comes through the kernel. So there's clients running in the rich execution environment that make requests, calls into this trusted environment where code can then run. And then there are various TAs that may do different purposes. So what we're talking about now is a specific media trusted application, which lives in this trusted operating system below the kernel. And we take all those scary things and we start pushing them down into the, the trusted execution environment. In this particular case, we see the key box, the secret key, and the decryption are pushed down. However, the video playback still kind of lives above that. We have these 
We can ask the trusted execution environment in order to decrypt this video, but now this buffer with the decrypted video is still accessible to user space. So we're getting better, but we're still not there. So the advantage here is the key is actually protected, but the plain text video still is visible at one point to user space. The creators are still sad and we don't get HD. So we still need one more thing and this is a kind of still a discussion and something that we're working through. I actually learned about something last night of another possible way of doing this. W we need some kind of what I'm calling a weird buffer. It's allocated, it's accessible to the secure side, but programs running in the kernel in user space cannot read this data. The only thing that can is the hardware video decoder. And that's why the hardware decoder is so important because we can't have software that can read this, only this hardware decoder. How do we do this? Um, there are s some patches going around called SNAF or SNAF, which is a secure memory allocator. I just learned there is a um, some patches that were going around in, um, where were they at? In another subsystem related to video playback and graphics that also have a secure memory allocator as part of their API. Um, ultimately, the requirement here is that we need some kind of buffer that's allocated that a trusted application is able to write to, but not the kernel, and the hardware is able to play that back. And this is tricky to get right. And a lot of things with security are tricky to get right. The, the slightest little weakness and suddenly you have all of your data. But once we get here, this is actually enough to make the content creators happy. So what I wanna talk about right now is this general solution. So not as much specifically widevine, but how does this problem get solved? I, I'd mentioned the key box and the secret key, so I just wanted to go through a little overview of how this happens. Some point generally during manufacture, the original equipment manufacturer, the people making the device will generate a key or they get the key from some kind of central authority. Um, in this instance, I've shown it as a key pair Turns out you don't actually need a key pair. It's fine to, for that to just be a shared secret. But this key has to be written into the device in this key box in the factory. And you have to do this in such a way that it can't be read outside of the secure environment. It's an important thing. Once it's written, later the user goes to playback video. The Media server and license server will generate a content key, so it's an unrelated key, usually just random numbers, that is how the video will be encrypted with this key. We then use the key box key to wrap this key. So we encrypt the content key with the key box key. So we now have a key that is only accessible to this code running in the, the secure side. This gets sent over the network through user space, through the kernel, down into the trusted execution environment. And by the way, this is obviously somewhat oversimplified. There's signatures, there's all kinds of other things going on to make sure that the key is actually correct. The trusted side then unwraps this key by reversing the encryption with the secret that it knows and is able to store this secret key inside the trusted environment so that when we come to play video, oh, when it's time to play video with all the other boxes up there, we have the content key, we can decrypt it, we use our hardware codec reading from these buffers we don't have access to, this goes out the video driver, we use something like HDCP to protect the content on the cable, ultimately we're now playing video, everyone is happy, and we could watch our movie. So Widevine specifics. Um, unfortunately, I can't tell you that much. There, 
there's NDAs and things like that. Um, but, but the basic idea is that there's a, a plugin that you write that's a shared library. And in this case, with the arrangement in Opti, it is the user space part of the client that speaks through the kernel API into the trusted execution environment that implements the kinds of calls you need in order to do these things, manage the keys, store them, decrypt the video into buffers, this kind of thing. So what's working? Um, we're doing this work on a high keyboard, it's a 96 board. The, I guess first thing is we have Opti available for this. There's, I believe, a version of this running in one of the Lenaro releases. We do also, on the security working group, we have our own local manifest to pull all of this into an AOSP build. We also have developed this libOEM crypto and the necessary TA to go with that, that implements this Wi-Fi content decryption module. So we have the flow, we have the, the implementation there, but it's not actually secure. So we find this a lot with, with Hikey. There's some things missing. The secure boot chain is not present. So yes, there's a trusted application that decrypts your video, but it could be modified. So that doesn't really make it secure. Um, we don't have the secure buffer management implemented yet. So the buffers actually just live in accessible data which is good because there's no hardware video playback yet on this target. So they do need to be read by user space. So in a sense, this is not a product. This is an example uh, of how this works. Um, somebody making a real product would solve these problems. Um, I think that's it. So that's kind of the overview that I had. I guess at this point, does anyone have any questions for me? We have a microphone that the denizens of the internet can hear. Um, why do you need secure video memory allocation? Because if you have a hardware decoder, um, the buffer can be allocated by the driver. Right. Right, and the application do not need to touch it. Right, so the, yeah. the thing is currently the, the decryption of the video is being done by software running in the trusted execution environment. So we need a place to store the decrypted video accessible by software. It's secured mm -hmm. software before the hardware can then play it back. The, 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 so what you have works if your hardware can do the decryption as well. If you have hardware such that you can load a key into it, then that driver can manage all the buffers. But in this particular configuration, we need this buffer to store the, vi the decrypted video to essentially hand the data between the trusted application and the hardware video playback. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got it, yeah. Okay. So, so actually, even though you're running in secure OS, in secure CPU mode, but you still see this is not secure, so therefore you need to allocate secure video memory. Unless your decoder can take the key from secure storage and decrypt and decode at the same time. Right, right? yeah, okay. which we don't have here. But um, yeah, okay, got it. Anything else? <coughs> Thank the, the, the secure buffer allocation patches you were saying, are, they, are these what patches to Opti or something? Or what, 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 what form do they say? Is this from some other place or it's just, uh, I don't um, know where that term was invented, SMAF or? Yeah, there's, one set of patches on SMAF that I listed there, I don't believe those contain any of the patches to Opti itself for that side of the support. Um, it's basically not finished. Uh, it's kind of an unsolved problem right now as to what will be acceptable to the upstream kernel that will still let us do the secure buffer management. How are you doing this on Android? Uh, the Opti, the secure buffer, uh, uh, um, uh, secure buffer management. Well, currently we're not. You're not. Okay. 
So, I mean, that's a that's still remaining work to be done. Okay. Are you planning to continue using ION on the Android too? For the workstation? It's one of the ideas that's okay. being tossed around. I mean, ION isn't exactly, is only sort of upstream anyway. Um, just a comment, I hate to put you on the spot, but <laughs> we've been telling our customers that everything we run in secure OS is secure. It's running on secure CPU mode that nobody can compromise. But it seems like um, we, we, that's not the case, right? We, we want to use secure memory uh, for decrypt the key. That seems like uh, the conclusion we're drawing here. Yeah. What's our good answer for that? <laughs> we're not providing a product is the thing here. This is, um, it's a reference implementation. Um, Opti is used in, in products now. The, these problems are, are solved just not on the hardware that we're running right now that we have available to do this work on. Um, I, I think there's still a lot of to be learned by doing it on this kind of hardware, even if the, the end result of say the firewall that protects the secure memory doesn't actually work on the hardware. We can still verify the, the flow of the data point is that for the end user, it shouldn't be too much work to take this up, what we have done here and put it on their own devices and you have the missing pieces that you, you always need to do that we can't do in an open reference impl implementation. Any other questions? Um, so both official and so the question was, how does Apple solve this problem in iOS? I would say both the official and correct answer is I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I would imagine the solution is something similar to the general solution that I proposed, just because that's, those are the pieces you need in order to protect your content. Um, I don't know what actually happens inside iOS. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions? When it uses remote display uh, connected with something like a mirror cast, uh, which layer is suitable to re-encode those, to those remote displaying? Yeah, I don't actually know. Um, you know, we've only done this with a, a directly connected display. I would imagine that if there's re, I mean, I can see two ways of doing that. One is to not re, not decode the data at all, and then send the encrypted, um, the encrypted stream directly to the remote display. Um, yeah, I mean, rumors that I've heard of things that do that kind of thing typically do it that way. I mean, you could also decode and re-encode and then you have more key management to deal with the display. Typically what's done in an environment where there's say a, a, a hub or home gateway that then encrypts the content to send to a, a thin client remote set top, they'll use something like DTCP IP or like a link layer encryption of that content. So it'll be decrypted, but they'll re-encrypt re the DTCP and then uh, decrypt that at the, um, the remote set-top. Okay. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you for attending. I hope this was informative. Thank you very much. <laughs>